Welcome to the Catholic Gentleman Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a man who lives with virtue and how to grow in holiness in today's world. Coming up today, we discuss why is there so much aversion to fasting from food today, and why do churches not promote this necessary spiritual discipline enough? There is a problem of convenience and comfort that has deadened men's lives and kept them from becoming the best man that they can be through the ways Christ instructed. Today's show is just one third of the incredible conversation that can be found in its entirety in our membership platform at Catholic Gentleman Plus. This month, we discuss fasting with Desert Father expert, spiritual director, and man of wisdom, Father David Ebernethy. To support the Catholic Gentleman and get tons of exclusive sessions, unique content, books, and challenges, head over to the CatholicGentlemanPlus.com or click on the link in the show notes. Hey, man, thanks for joining us on this month's episode with a guest expert, Father David Abernethy, on fasting. Among many things, Father David Abernethy is a Byzantine priest. He is an expert in desert spirituality, a new EWTN series coming out. We'll talk about that at the very end. But he is also a spiritual director. He's been an incredible mentor and guide to both Sam and I here at The Catholic Gentleman and some of our other listeners on the podcast. And we really couldn't be more excited about talking about fasting. We felt like uh, Eastern spirituality, uh, the Desert Fathers, uh, mysticism, and of course, the richness and traditions of the church um, and related to fasting is something that can, can benefit all men's lives, but we often don't understand it. We'll see it in scripture, but then we won't really know how to bring that to our lives in a way that incrementally allows us to grow in holiness. And so I want to start with a quote that actually Father David gave me a long time ago, and then dive into just the basics of fasting, and we'll go from there. So the quote is from St. Isaac the Syrian, and it reads, fasting is the champion of every virtue, the beginning of the struggle, the mother of prayer, the wellspring of sobriety and prudence, the teacher of stillness, and the precursor of all good works. When a man begins to fast, he straightaway yearns in his mind to enter into converse with God. And every single time I read that quote, and in fact, in preparation for this conversation here, I was like, my goodness, well, I've forgotten that the last three months of my fasting. I wish I would have remembered that. So much more motivating. So, Father, to start out, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm doing very well. And it's always a joy to work with you and Sam and especially to be able to talk about the fathers, and in particular, the ascetic disciplines. Uh, in so many ways, I think it's something that uh, all people within the church, but especially men in our day, given the things that we face day in and day out uh, through the culture, need. And in terms of the ascetic life as a whole, how is it that we direct ourselves toward God? and have all that we do as men, whether as a priest, father, working in the world, how do we have all of these things be directed toward him and be guided by his grace and move away from living our, our faith life in an episodic fashion where it is left to us to think about God periodically. And uh, if we're very busy in our day-to-day -day life, and I think our work today, especially, we're focused on computer screens or constantly involved in discussions with others. Our labor is very, requires of us uh, a kind of attention uh, to the things that are before us that can pull us away from God mm -hmm. and the mindfulness that the saints speak of, to remember him at every moment. And so when we talk about the Desert Fathers in particular, which we will do tonight, one of the, the works that they sought to do was physical labor and to focus more on the work of their hands. So if they produced something in order to support themselves, they would gravitate to handwork because it allowed them to continue to pray constantly, even as they engaged in the work to support themselves. And uh, I think as we've moved from away from an agrarian society to, you know, post-industrial age, and now very much focused upon technology, that we are so sort of drawn into this virtual world that kind of captivates our attention. Mm 
and imagination on such a deep level that uh, we can lose sight of God. Our minds and our imaginations, uh, as I mentioned, are taken hold of by what it is that we are viewing or hearing. Uh, St. Paul says in one of his letters, the second letter to the Corinthians, we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Mm. And I think what we find happening so often in our day-to-day -day life is that our minds are taken captive. Our thoughts are taken captive by everything around us. And so when we come to speak of the spiritual disciplines, and then as we come to speak about fasting in particular, it is to help us become more mindful of God. It is not a, a discipline, in other words, or a test of endurance that is abstracted from the, the reality of the person of Christ in our relationship with him. And I think because the fathers and the quote that you mentioned from St. Isaac the Syrian uh, emphasize it so heavily is that it is that first step toward God and dealing with one of our fundamental appetites, one of our fundamental desires for food to nourish ourselves. And so all things within our, our lives as human beings have known the touch of sin. And so even something as fundamental as an appetite, our desire for food can become very disordered. And we are no longer eating simply for our health or to nourish ourselves for the day, uh, but to satisfy some emotional need that we might have. And uh, so we can eat aggressively. We can eat to fill a void within us. We can eat uh, because we are de depressed. And so seeking to fill ourselves, we, we gravitate to what is immediately at hand. And also that's what seems to offer this concrete satisfaction. And so there's nothing like food that mm. it involves the senses. We smell it, we taste it, and we can see it. And, and so when we find ourselves burdened or emptied from the day's labor, uh, our tendency, I think, is to grab something to fill that, that need, to fill yeah, that absolutely. hunger. And uh, I think what helps us, and in, in maybe as we begin, uh, to frame the practice of, of fasting is when we begin to see it, as I mentioned, not simply as a discipline abstracted from God, but as something that we take up. Uh, realizing that every desire that we have within us is rooted in our being created in his image and likeness, that we are created as desiring beings. Yeah. And so the Desert Fathers, for all of their uh, discipline and for all of their restraint, uh, the restraint was not simply to punish themselves or, uh, again, test their endurance, but rather to increase desire and their attachment where it needed to be focused, and that was on God. And uh, so the practice of fasting humbles the mind and the body in such a way that we become more aware of our need for God, and that he alone is the one who satisfies the deepest longings of the human heart. And it makes perfect sense to us, and especially for Catholic men, that our Lord would give himself to us as food, that he would uh, enter into the deepest intimacy uh, with us by, through the bread and wine, giving us his body and blood to drink, and drawing us into the very intimacy of the life of the most holy trinity. So our experience of eating becomes transformed. And we see it now in light of the Holy Eucharist that we can receive daily or weekly. And we also begin to see our practice of fasting as tied up into that reality with them as well. That we create this hunger within us on a physical level in order that we might hunger for he who alone can satisfy it. And so when yeah. we look to the gospel, and I'll pause here uh, to let you interject, but in, when we look to the gospel, Jesus, when he's questioned about his disciples not fasting, he tells the crowds uh, they have the bridegroom with them. This is not the time for fasting, but rather for feasting, mm. 
Uh, yet there will be a time when the bridegroom is taken away, and then they will fast. And I think this is what makes the Christian fasting so powerful. Christ reshapes it and gives it this newer and deeper meaning. In the past, when we say we look at the Old Testament, fasting was done for a lot of different reasons. Repentance and remembrance of the destruction of the temple uh, in preparation for the study of Scripture, in preparation for battle. Uh, and so there are all these different reasons that within uh, the Jewish community that fasting was a regular part of their day-to-day -day life. But in and through Christ, all things become transformed. And so even this fundamental discipline of the spiritual life now is directed toward him and the meaning that he has given it. He is the bread of life. And so a kind of fasting will begin where we will refrain from eating food. We will uh, allow ourselves to experience that hunger, but also that we might, in our minds, tie it to our relationship with Christ, that that desire, that hunger we begin to see can only be satisfied with him. And indeed, this is why the church has us fast before receiving Holy Communion. I know in recent times, that has been reduced to an hour, and rarely do we get hungry within an hour. Uh, but stretching out that period of fasting prior to receiving the Holy Eucharist is a good practice because mm -hmm. it allows us to prepare ourselves on a, a multitude of levels in mind, how we think about the Eucharist, but also physically. We, we come to the altar hungering and thirsting for the Lord. Amen. Such richness here you have touched on from the physical to the mental to the spiritual. And it is so much depth when when you speak. So thank you. But I want to I want to mention that you're referring to fasting constantly as food. And I I am so grateful for that because i think the idea a notion of fasting has become confused in our, in our day there's a lot of priests i i i heard a priest not too long ago state we must remember to fast from sin and it's like no no you don't fast you you don't sin like that's our that's our drive like that's a that's a precept that's that's the reality of our existence as catholic men and so we also hear this idea of fasting from um TV or fasting from technology, which can truly be heroic, and we absolutely uh, need to do those things as men, as a spirit, or sorry, as a self-discipline, as a mortification. But for our men, I'd love for you to talk about exactly from the basic what fasting is, because I know in Scripture fasting was referring to food and drink, and what fasting in our dialogue that we're having right here, which you and I didn't prepare about this, but is absolutely on the same page, fasting actually is. And what, let's start right there. Right. I've heard that said many times as well. Uh, almost a kind of resistance to the notion of fasting from food I agree. or diminishing the importance of it. And yet we find that nowhere within the scriptures and we find that nowhere within the fathers themselves. They might speak of fasting from other things and tie it uh, to, for example, we've been reading St. John Climacus, and he describes fasting from sleep that, as an appetite, a bodily appetite that is necessary for us as human beings. We will limit it in order that we don't spend half of our life unconscious, yeah. that we would fast from sleep in order that we might pray, open up time for prayer. So the fathers do speak in that way, but uh, one and all speak of fasting from food as being uh, the stepping stone for us, because it is the most immediate appetite that we have as human beings. From the moment that we come out of the womb, the first thing that we do is eat. We are fed. And uh, and so it's such a strong aspect of our humanity that uh, when we think about beginning the spiritual life and allowing all that is part of being a human being to be transformed by the grace of God, that we would begin with the simplest thing and work outward from there. 
And so the Desert Fathers saw that this is where uh, the passions often begin for us, this disorder with eating. And so you can see it in how they uh, lay out for us the seven deadly sins or capital sins mm -hmm. or the eight vices as Cassian lays them out. Always at the very beginning of that list is gluttony, lust, avarice. The, the very appetites that are tied to material things or material appetites, our need for food, our sexual appetite, and then our attachment to material goods. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how does one begin to battle with the passions that are of a greater spiritual nature? Say when we uh, look at vainglory, sloth, or pride, how is it that one can begin to have the strength of will as well as the alertness of mind, vigilance of mind, unless we have undergone this spiritual warfare, strengthened our will in order to overcome our, as it were, addiction to food, our passion for it in such a way that it leads us into gluttony. Yeah. And there are all different kinds of, uh, of gluttony. And oftentimes we think of the person stuffing their face, you know, in a kind of grotesque fashion. Uh, but many of the saints laid out that there can be this particularity that we have about food, wanting it just so, wanting it rich, wanting it when we want it, uh, that it is all a part of our, our gluttony. And so fasting allows us to bring an order, again, to this basic appetite that touches so many different things in our life, including our relationship with others. Eating is not only a private enterprise. It is something that we uh, engage others in while we are doing it. It becomes a form of communion. Yeah. And again, this is why it's easy for us to understand why Christ would establish this deepest sense of communion in and through the celebration of, of the Eucharist. That, in fact, uh, the word companion means exactly that. Those who compon us break bread with each other. Mm -hmm. And so our learning to fast, our learning how to order this appetite, also affects the way that we engage others. And look and look at others and the, the way that we engage in discussion with them and how we see relationships as a whole, not uh, with a kind of uh, desire to consume them simply to satisfy our own needs, not to objectify the other, uh, but to see them as a human being created in the image and likeness of God. And so we first, though, have to begin with ourselves and be, look at ourselves in this way, not to objectify ourselves by failing to order how we eat. If we are not being attentive to our own health, but how the way that we eat affects our relationship with others, engage in our work, but most especially how it affects our prayer, then uh, if we're not able to do that with ourselves, we aren't going to be able to do that with others. We're going to lose sight of who they are as created in the image and likeness of God. There's something about fasting, and this is where John Climacus, when speaking about sleep in particular, one of the fruits of it is that it creates alertness. Mm -hmm. Bodily vigil yeah. creates spiritual vigil. Mm -hmm. And so our staying up later to pray allows us then to uh, develop the spiritual vigil where we are attentive to our thoughts, our daydreams, what's going on in our mind. But all of that begins with fasting, where we become aware and alert to, to what's going on within us, what is driving our appetites, uh, especially our appetite for food. Are we eating simply to nourish ourselves, or are we eating for a more emotional reason? And even to the point of making food an idol, a god for ourselves. And I think many people who would come to the United States and walk through one of our grocery stores would say and that we've made an idol out of food. 
it's often shocking to people who come to our country to see the sheer abundance and the, the abundance that is thrown away or to see the number of commercials on television that have to do with food, constantly putting out that suggestion. You need more to satisfy you. That's right. And you touch on uh, very personal. We've had a friend from England come over here, and when they saw our large drink, they were at like a McDonald's, they were shocked and they had no clue that cups came that big. You know, they were, they were, and then a friend from Australia stayed with us. And I remember she just came up and just talked about how there's sugar in everything. She's like, I couldn't find bread that didn't have sugar in it. And there's just this abundance, as you were saying, it has to be a certain way. It has to be a certain richness, it has to be a certain flavor. Um, and, and I couldn't agree more. I loved how you said it was, it's the most immediate appetite when we are born. And therefore it makes so much sense that Christ would uh, uh, require us to fast, you know, um, when you fast and pray. And uh, he, I mean, he said that. And I think that it's it's so beautiful the way you speak of fasting, because there is so much richness to it. And actually, I'd like to go into that in some of the reasons of why we fast, because fasting today has a lot of buzzwords about it, right? There's the intermittent fasting, something that I myself do. There is, um, but that's for dietary reasons. And then there's the, um, you know, we already talked about maybe misunderstandings of fasting, but there's the idea of fasting for self-control. I talked to a couple Hindu individuals that fast on a regular basis. And when I, when I probed them a little bit more as to why that was the case, it was because they needed to practice self-control because they wanted to dedicate their time and talent to their occupation. And they knew that if they were constantly looking at pleasures and desires and things like that and hadn't learned to focus on their self-control, even Hindus, and I don't know the full depth of their, their religion in this aspect, but even them understood that fasting for them is self-control. But when I brought this up to you over two years ago or so, um, I remember that I was just talking about the meritorious aspect, the fact that there's an intention I apply to fasting. There is um, there is a, uh, yes, all those known benefits, but maybe, you know, uh, there's a merit because I'm doing it for reparation of my sins. And you were so quick to point out, um, and I think it was St. John Climacus who, who stated um, that fasting makes for purity of prayer, and it is for that conversation with Christ, and it's for that that union with Christ that we fast these things. And so I'd love for you to talk about just some, because you can read Aquinas, and you can read Augustine, you can read Basil, and you can read all of these different saints, and they all have their litany or their list of things that fasting helps. But let's bring it down to, to um, just hearing from you, either a reminder for some of us men or or just maybe the first time of, of why it is that we fast. Because I do want to talk about the fruits of fasting and getting into fasting and, and how to overcome obstacles. But before we get there, I'd love to hear from you just, just that essence and, and, and the, the depths and maybe even the different reasons why we as men should be fasting. Well, you know, I think the simplest answer to that is Christ himself, uh, that he becomes the model and the standard for us, that it's the incarnation and our understanding of the incarnation, that uh, in order for all to be redeemed, all must be assumed. And so he takes upon our humanity, our flesh and all of its poverty, and he does so uh, to redeem us, not only from our sin, but also to open our eyes to the glory uh, that is ours as sons and daughters of God, that we've been created in the image and likeness of God, and that we are destined for uh, this life and sharing in the fullness of life, the life of the Holy Trinity. And so what Christ reveals to us in the embrace of our humanity is the love, the mercy, and the compassion of God. But he also reveals to us our identity, our dignity as men and women created in the image of our Lord. And uh, so we look to Christ certainly all as the end, the, the goal of our fasting, to heighten our desire, our longing, our hunger for him, as we've mentioned. But we look to him as the standard and the model for us. And we see it as he uh, comes forth out of, you know, out of this uh, kind of obscurity from his life uh, as a carpenter and begins 
not by stepping immediately into his ministry, but rather being driven into the desert by the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. there to fast and pray for 40 days. And so we see him, uh, in order to prepare himself to discern the Father's will, but also to embrace it, he embraces that humanity. He humbles himself in these very powerful ways, fasting for the 40 days, as well as praying in silence for the 40 days. And emerges from that, as we know, then to be tempted. And one of the temptations in particular is directed at his self-identity, having embraced our humanity. So having come out of the desert after fasting for 40 days, we were told in the Gospels he was hungry. And the evil one tempts our Lord almost in exactly the same way as Adam and Eve. He directs the temptation toward their his self-identity as one who's assumed our humanity in its poverty. And so uh, change the stones into bread. Why embrace this poverty of your humanity when in and through your divine power, you can immediate you could immediately satisfy that. Uh, we're, but whereas Adam and Eve uh, gave themselves over the temptation, take of the fruit of the tree and eat of it, and your eyes will be open and you will become like God. Mm. And then suddenly they could not control their own passions. Our Lord does not succumb to the temptation, but rather quotes scripture back to the evil one. Man does not live by bread alone, but rather from every word that comes forth from God. That our true nourishment comes from the Lord of life who has created us and redeemed us. And so we are shown right from the beginning, not only in what he says, in what he teaches, but in rather what he does. 30 years of silence and obscurity, the hidden life, which I don't think is often explored uh, enough uh, by Christians. Uh, There wasn't this move to activism, but rather this radical embrace simply of his humanity and his identity, and and living in this relationship with his heavenly father. And uh, and when before he begins the act of ministry, then to enter into this period of of deep penance and mortification, in order that he might be prepared for the spiritual battle that he's going to undergo. Uh, And we see it in the temptations, Uh, When the fathers speak of this, they not only make reference to it, but also to the temptations that we will experience as well. That I think one of the ways, one of the reasons we've gravitated away from fasting is that we've lost sight of the spiritual life as being warfare Mm. and warfare against sin. And we've turned it into an act of Christianity, into a kind of activism external to ourselves rather than understanding that the active life for us is our struggle against the passions in order that we might love God and love others without any impediment. And so we we take up this fasting, realizing that uh, it is to create within us a hunger for the word of God and his will and imitation of our Lord, but also to prepare us It becomes for us a weapon, a spiritual weapon, if you will, to engage in the spiritual battle Mm -hmm. with clarity, with purity of heart that gives us the ability uh, to discern that which is from God or from the evil one. And so, again, it's the first step in that formation of the mind and the heart. And people have probably experienced many listening to this that often when we set ourselves to engage in the practices of Lent or just in general in our spiritual life, when we decide to deepen our discipline of prayer or after we receive the Holy Eucharist or after we've gone to confession and received this abundance of grace, this is often the time that we are afflicted the most. A wave of temptations will come against us because the evil one, 
sets himself to disrupt the deepening of that relationship with the Lord. And so if he can get us to fall immediately after this, he can set us upon the path of shame, of despondency, and become our great accuser. Anything to draw us away from prayer and intimacy with God, he will do. And we have to realize that there is not anything that the devil hasn't thought of or made use of. And that there is a demon for everything that we struggle with in the spiritual life. And so we cannot be under the illusion that our spiritual disciplines, simply as ends in themselves, are going to be the thing that protect us or strengthen us in this battle. It's precisely because these ascetical disciplines, fasting, make us more open and radically open to God. We are acknowledging our poverty, our need for what he alone can provide, his grace, in order to persevere in that spiritual battle. When we turn it in to, as you said, uh, a matter of health yeah. uh, or of altering our state of mind in some way or freeing up ourselves to work in a way that we would desire then it we've turned it into an end in itself, and that's yes. its own reward. We remember the, the gospel that's read on Ash Wednesday in the Latin Rite, where Jesus goes through an explanation of this. If you fast in order that others see you fasting, mm. then you have your reward. And the, the actual translation is you have your payment in full. Mm. And so you have, we can practice our fasting in that way for the satisfaction, even within our own mind, of being disciplined. Or when we see ourselves losing weight, or other people in the church would see us engaged in that fast. Very easily, ego and pride comes into the picture. And so coming back to where I began, that our focus from the beginning of every spiritual discipline has to be Christ. And our desire and our longing for him. Mm. The moment that we take our eyes off of him is when we can, tempt to, can be tempted to see those disciplines as something other than what they are. We can be just as willful in our religiosity as we are in anything else in our day-to-day -day life. And so we can willfully take up our spiritual disciplines. I'm going to pray this amount of time or I'm going to fast this amount of time. And never listen to where God is guiding us in terms of the practice of fasting, either through our spiritual director, through our own prayer, through the experience of fasting itself. That instead we will will set the, the limits, the boundaries of that for ourselves uh, if we practice it at all. In fact, in our willfulness, we might tell ourselves, well, we really don't need to fast from food. We can fast mm. from other things, even fast from our sin as a, as a way of yeah. engaging in that spiritual battle. And the fathers would not understand this at all in terms yeah. of that vision of what it is to be a human being in relationship to God. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Catholic Gentleman. I was so moved and inspired by what Father David Abernethy had to say that I pulled out this portion for the public episode this week. If you want to get the rest of this conversation, where we go into three times more questions, including how to stay motivated with fasting, the fruits of fasting, and how to overcome obstacles, head over to the CatholicGentlemanPlus.com, where you will find not only this conversation, but additional sessions on self-mastery, the spiritual life, relationships, prayer, and the ability to join our monthly live Q&A. Remember, be a man, be a saint. God bless.